Hello, and welcome to uh, the second episode of what we are calling Patrick Replies. See, it's a fun riff on Patrick Explains, but here I'm going to reply to, you know, your comments and your questions and stuff like that, specifically about the Zack Snyder video, which is out. It's been out for several days now, uh, and so far, the response to it has not ruined my life like everyone was afraid that it would, so huge success. Honestly, though, uh, thank you for the very nice response to the video. It has been shockingly well-received for a video about uh, a contentious topic, so it's been, it's been really nice so far. I just had dinner, I poured myself a drink, and now we are here uh, for me to reply to your questions and comments and, I don't know, things people said that, uh, that Emma, the great Emma Logsdon, our, our community manager, uh, pulled for me that I'm going to look at and reply to. Important thing I should mention, the first set of questions that I will always answer in these videos are from our Discord server. There's an Ask Patrick channel there uh, to gather questions specifically for these videos. And the Discord server is exclusively for members of our Patreon. And so if you want to get questions in for me to answer in future videos, you got to join the Patreon. And since a few people complained with the first video that they didn't want to watch me answer random questions about sandwiches, they only wanted to see me talk about the new episode, well, I have added chapter markers onto this video, and so if you want, you can skip ahead and um, skip over all the Discord questions to get straight to the comments from the Snyder video. All right, we're going to the top, and... J period says, do you believe certain film roles are unrecastable, like Indiana Jones, Wolverine, etc., or should we as an audience accept recasting as we already do in TV and theater? Okay, so my take on this is that I think it differs uh, between whether the role originated in source material that was adapted for film or if that role originated in film. For instance, Wolverine. Uh, Hugh Jackman gave a great, iconic performance. When we think Wolverine, we all think of him. But also, Wolverine had existed for like 25 years or so before Hugh Jackman played that role. And comic book Wolverine uh, is fairly different from movie Wolverine. For one thing, he's like a foot shorter. And also there have been animated versions and versions in video games. There are many different interpretations of Wolverine and also the one movie version is still like a departure in some ways from the comic book version. So while casting a new Wolverine, you know, leaves huge shoes to fill, and I don't envy whatever actor they pick, um, we've already seen different versions of that character. They can go closer to the comic book version. I think there is there is room to do a new take there. But then there's like Indiana Jones. And the thing about Indiana Jones is that there's no source material. There's just the movies. And I know there's like the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, but when it comes to adult Indiana Jones, that has only ever been Harrison Ford. And so the idea of someone new taking over that role, the only thing to compare them to is Harrison Ford. There's You can't go like, oh, well, we're going closer to the original version from the book. There is no book. It's only Harrison Ford. And in those cases, uh, I would say, just don't do it. Make something new. I mean, it was hard enough for Alden Ehrenreich, who's a good actor, to try to play young Harrison Ford. Don't put that weight on someone's shoulders. Just just don't make an Indiana Jones without a Harrison Ford. Anyway, this is not a scientific thing. That's just my take on it. Red is here, says, questions heard in the favorite movie podcast. What movie would you pair Night of the Coconut with for a double feature and in what order? That's a good question. I've thought of three different answers that are all wildly different. I'll let you guys pick from these. Okay, my three potential pairings for Night of the Coconut, as in doing a double feature, would be Batman Forever, Josie and the Pussycats, and Contagion. Uh, and in each case, uh, let's do, let's do uh, Night of the Coconut second. Yeah, let's do let's do my movie last. And in the Night of the Coconut Monopoly edition, what would be the six playable tokens? Okay, I love this question. Okay, Night of the Coconut Monopoly. 
Okay, first of all, we cannot have a coconut piece. You can't have a piece that is the villain of the movie. That is out. First of all, obviously a hammer. Duh. Second, I'm gonna say uh, Chloe's little wrist computer thing, which I, I know is a calculator. A glass of wine. I think that, that makes sense. A mustache. Oh, five, a pair of sunglasses. Oh, and number six, uh, a can of coconut LaCroix. Samuel asks, any plans for more in-person events like the night of the coconut premiere? I hope so. I, I should say no, no immediate plans, but I would like to do that. The thing about like live events is I, whenever I'd thought of it before, I'd always convinced myself like, no one would show up. It would be a big failure. Uh, no, it's it's not it's not worth doing. And then we did the night of the coconut premiere, and not only did we fill the thing, but like the waiting list for tickets was really long, and so that pretty much confirmed that oh, people will show up for a live event. I just a am usually too busy to and like stressed out with other other things to like figure out what would the live event be and like. Organizing things seems stressful. Um, but yeah, like, I can't do a live video essay. This isn't a podcast where it's like, oh, we'll just do a live episode. Um, I don't know, would we just like do comment, would I like talk over a movie and do commentary? Would we do like a fake talk show episode? Do we like a variety show? Chloe can sing a song. Tell me in the comments, uh, what, what, what should we do for live events? I'd be totally down for that. Aram asks, it just hit me that I'm not aware of an official recommended wine to pair with Night of the Coconut. That's a great question. It's gotta be a Coppola wine, you know. I, I, I gotta give a shout out to my close personal friend, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, let's say the the Coppola uh, Sophia Rosé. I think a rosé, like a nice, crisp, light, you know, summery wine is the right kind of feel for this you know, light, silly movie. And um, I, I, like the, I like the Sophia Rosé. I think it's fun that it's named after Sofia Coppola. So, uh, so that's it. Aram also asks, how does it feel to direct Aronofsky? What is his catch to drop ratio? That's a very good question. Um, so the thing about uh, Darren Aronofsky's cameo in Night of the Coconut is that um, I was not aware it was happening until Dave sent me the footage of his cameo. Dave knows him and Dave asked him if he would do it. Uh, so I had no interaction with Darren for that. Um, I had not met him at the time. Since then, I have met him on the shoot for the uh, the promo video for his book, Monster Club, in stores now. Um, and uh, I did not direct that video. Um, I had a little cameo uh, at the beginning where I talked to Darren and then I just hung out on set uh, you know, while most mostly Mike Worth, who also has a cameo Night of the Coconut in the same scene. Mike, who who uh, directs the, all the Nebula classes, he directed that shoot. And so um, Mike actually directed Darren. I did not. But Darren's a nice guy. And he's also a professional and can like, like talk clearly and eloquently and humorously on camera very easily. He's a seasoned professional. Um, so yeah. Uh, I imagine he'd be pretty easy to direct. The Sorcerer So-So says, super basic bitch question, how do you obtain usable clips from movies and shows, etc.?" So I get this question a lot. People ask me on Twitter, people email me, people send me Twitter DMs about it. People have asked me so many times that a couple of years ago, um, I wrote the directions for how I get footage from movies to use for videos in my notes app, and then I screenshotted that, and so whenever people ask me, I just send them that screenshot. And so here it is now. You can pause the video. Moving on. Gabby DeBorg, I'm, I'm so sorry if I, I'm mispronouncing your name or anyone else's names, um, says, has three questions. What was the highlight in Stockholm? For those who don't know, I went to Stockholm for a week over the summer. It was fantastic. You know what, the highlight was just getting really into uh, fika culture which as far as I'm aware, in Sweden, fika is basically just taking a break and having some coffee and often a pastry. Um, I spent the majority of the trip uh, sitting at cafes, drinking cappuccinos and reading. It was 
lovely. It was <laughs> such a wonderful vacation. So yeah, um, highlight of, of Stockholm was literally just hanging out at cafes in Stockholm. Also, I did walk all over the city. I saw so much of it. Uh, I ate a lot of good food. I went to a lot of good re restaurants. I'm dying to go back. Uh, Stockholm is, is now one of my favorite places in the world. Um, okay, what's your opinion of John Carpenter? Can I ever hope to see you do a video about one of his movies? I love John Carpenter. I, I love John Carpenter in the way I feel like we all love John Carpenter. Like, the reason I haven't done a video on him and have no immediate plan to do a video on him is I don't feel like I have anything new to say about John Carpenter. It's like, oh yeah, Halloween is a masterpiece. It invented, you know, the, the modern slasher movie. The Thing is, I think, is the best John Carpenter movie. Um... My other favorite might be Big Trouble in Little China. Um, like, I, I think he's great. Uh, I love his music. Uh, I listen to it a lot. And that's the thing, like, John Carpenter has been talked about a lot. I think he's great. Um, and I just, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not opposed to doing a John Carpenter video by any means. Um, I just don't have a new take on him. Um, ooh, fourth question. Um, Mads Mikkelsen or Brian Cox as Hannibal Lecter? Um, I think between those two, it's Mickelson. I love Michael Mann's Manhunter. I think Brian Cox is really good in it. I do think that anyone who says that Brian Cox is the best Hannibal Lecter, that is the contrarian hipster answer that no one really believes. Um, he's really good in that movie. Also, Lecter is such a small part of it that it's like, there's, there's no way you can say that that's the best version of the character compared to, like, Hopkins or Mickelson. I don't, I don't believe you if you say that. Alan Smithy says, Since We Heart Hartnett ended its original run, have you gone back and watched any of Josh's movies just for fun? And if so, have your feelings on them changed? I honestly don't think I have. Sorry, Josh. The Sorcerer So So, back again, says, Oh, hey, did you ever get your hands on Legends of the Dark Knight? Shaman. I did. For those who don't know, I know on the last episode I talked about my ongoing project of reading uh, Post-Crisis Batman, uh, and that involved tracking down some of the collected editions of the early story arcs in Legend of the Dark Knight, um, some of which have been out of print for years. And um, I believe, let me just check the name, Michael Lee, uh, who hooked me up. Uh, with this copy of Shaman. So thank you, Michael. Dreamer Shill says, Wish I had thought to say this before the last talkback video, but I think Shazam is the closest a modern superhero film has got to capturing the same energy as Raimi's Spider-Man, particularly in terms of emphasizing saving people and having average people that are memorable despite only being in a scene or two. Thoughts? So I've only seen Shazam once when it was in theaters. I recall having a bunch of fun with it. Um, and from what I recall, um, I think y you might be right. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that all checks out. You know, you, they spend so much time with just the, you know, the, like, the foster family, um, there, and they're all, like, regular people, and, uh, it's, then we sit in Philadelphia, right? Yeah, and it's like, uh, you know, you see, you see, like, some of, like, Philly, and that's cool. Um, you're probably right, I should watch Shazam again, at least before the sequel comes out. Rasmus Larson says, What are your thoughts on Sidney Lumet? Started with Black and White in 1957 and stopped on Digital in 2007. Worked with too many of the greatest actors of their time to even start naming here. For my money, he's one of the greatest directors. While movies like 12 Angry Men, Network, and Dog Day Afternoon are talked about often, he as a director feels severely underappreciated in online movie discourse. You're basically right. I mean, like, I, I think you're right. Uh, Sidney Lumet... Um, is great. Uh, earlier this year, I read his book, Making Movies, which everyone should read. It's one of the best books about filmmaking I've ever read. I think the reason that he doesn't get talked about as much these days is that he doesn't fit into our concept of an auteur. Like, like he does not seem to have a distinct style or voice that carries over from movie to movie. He was just a really good craftsman who made a lot of really good movies that don't immediately seem like they would be made by the same guy. Like, you'd never guess that the same guy made 12 Angry Men and Network and then Murder on the Orient Express and The Wiz. Uh, he's got an eclectic filmography. Um, he was just a really 
good director. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it really is kind of one of the ultimate examples of those guys uh, who has a great body of work, made some of the best movies ever, but that, oh, you know, they don't have, like, recognizable, like, ticks or styles, and they didn't put their, like, personal stamp on the movie. Um, and so, but yeah, he, he he's, he's really good. I don't have any big take, but I think that's why he doesn't get talked about a lot. Elliot Gammons says, is Christian Bale playing you in a biopic? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. Wait, do I, do I own those pants? Sambo is person says, will there be a Night of the Coconut DVD and or Blu-ray release? There is no immediate plan. We have just kind of casually talked about it a little bit. That said, if people demand it, if there is like a clear indication that a lot of people would want to buy a Night of the Coconut Blu-ray, uh, then we would make that happen. So balls in your court, people. Con Ratter says, with the comments videos, will there still be a Christmas Q&A? Absolutely. Look, one of my favorite Christmas traditions is to force my sister Mary to sit down next to me and have a tough time pronouncing people's names while reading off of an iPad. So yes, we'll totally be doing it. The Duke of Tumwater says, what are your thoughts on fan theories as they pertain to popular entertainment and the effect that they have on people's expectations and the surrounding discourse. I don't think fan theories are like a major problem, but I, I'm just generally not very interested in them because they usually involve like obsessing over lore and trivia over like just, you know, looking at the movie and like talking about what it has to say. Pinball Witch uh, says, very interested in the Snyder video as he's a director I've always had very mixed feelings about. Uh, obviously this came out before the Snyder video uh, was released. I'm curious if you've watched anyone else's video essays about him. I really like Maggie Mae Fish's ones. And one I found particularly interesting was Sophie from Mars's, who was a guest on Maggie's, which looked at his work examining their objectivism. Yes. I had watched these videos before when they came out. I re-watched those videos uh, during the long process of putting mine together. I think Maggie Snyder videos are great. I think Sophie Snyder video is great. Obviously, I came to like somewhat different conclusions than they did, and uh, and I don't find Snyder quite as like toxic, I guess, uh, as they do, um, but. They have really good videos that uh, make very strong arguments, and so they're absolutely worth checking out if you have not already seen them. Red is Here says, if you could be a fly on the wall for the production of any movie, which one would it be? I have thought about this before, and for me, it would be Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, from what I know about that production, the little that I know about it, um, it was weird and uh, and obviously kept very much under wraps, very secretive, but uh, a lot of stuff was changing um, as far as I'm aware during that production. Um, and I don't like that movie. Um, and so I'm like, look, if I did not get any enjoyment from the movie itself, I would at least like to get some enjoyment from juicy stories uh, that happened like behind the scenes in the making of that movie. And so, yeah. I would really like to get the full story of what went on with episode nine. Scape says, is there a TV show that you think deserves a remake? Honest, honestly, no, not that I can think of. Cinematic Bread says, how does Robert Zemeckis' Pinocchio remake hold up to your prior thoughts on Zemeckis, and how do you think that Pinocchio will compare to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio? Um, I have not seen the Robert Zemeckis Pinocchio. I don't really intend to watch that movie. No one seems to like it. I also haven't even watched all of uh, Zemeckis' The Witches. I only watched the first 20 or 30 minutes. I didn't turn it off because it was bad, although I wasn't really enjoying it very much. Um, I just put it on late at night and I was tired and went to bed and never 
you know, watch the rest. A thing that I wonder about sometimes is, let's take Zemeckis as an example. So I made the Zemeckis video, and then Zemeckis released new movies afterwards. And I wonder, like, should I do some kind of follow-up thing, like a bonus unscripted video on Nebula, where I, like, just cover like this new installment on uh, like this like director's work or like in this series or franchise or genre or whatever and talk about how it fits into what I said before. Anyway, I've wondered about that, but then for instance, until right now, not a single person has asked me about the Zemeckis Pinocchio. So I don't think anyone really is dying, you know, for me to, to do a video about that. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the Del Toro Pinocchio. Looks great. And then, uh, then it says, also, can you say Snack Zider? Dr. Turkey says, what was the first movie that you remember made you realize that movies could be bad? I remember this one clearly, actually. I think it was 97. Uh, and I, I remember, I didn't see it in theaters, but I remember renting Mortal Kombat Annihilation. I I loved the first one, you know, what eight-year-old boy in the mid-90s doesn't love Paul W.S. Anderson's Mortal Kombat? And I watched the sequel. In, like, the first scene, they kill Johnny Cage uh, in such a dumb way. And they, sorry, they recast Johnny Cage and then kill him. And right away I was like, I don't like this. This, this isn't good. Um, and look, I, I was still a dumb kid and, and liked plenty of bad movies after that, but, um, but that was the first time a movie that I should have liked, um, disappointed me. Mr. Wonko says, many of Snyder's needle drops essentially feel like music videos to me. So I've been watching a lot of 80s movies as research for the next video, and... The needle drops in those movies feel so much more like music videos than anything in Snyder's movies. Like, I watched Flashdance the other night, and that is a movie that is just all music videos. Uh, like, th those have uh, Snyder's movies have nothing on those. But um, what do you think about the idea of a Snyder musical? I'm totally into it. To be fair, I want everyone to make musicals, but I think Snyder would actually be pretty well suited for it. And the musical number in the extended version of Sucker Punch with Oscar Isaac and Carla Gugino singing, I think, Love is the Drug, um, actually, like, pretty good and, uh, and well shot and choreographed and staged and everything. So, yeah, I would like to see Snyder do a musical. Yeah, have some fun, Zach. Red is here, once again, says, Weird question about Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. Do you prefer the 16-9 aspect ratio of the first movie or the 21-9 format of the other two? I mean, my sweet spot in terms of, like, the visuals of Raimi's uh, movies is Spider-Man 2, shot by Bill Pope, in 239-1. Looks amazing. I wish more superhero movies would be shot in like 1851 in like the taller aspect ratio. Like there's Spider-Man 1, there's Avengers 1, and then some occasionally there's like, oh, in like the IMAX version on Disney Plus. But in general, like ev like every Marvel thing, even their TV shows are in like cinema scope, which I think honestly, I think that's dumb. She-Hulk should have been in, like, proper 16-9 fill-the-whole-TV screen. Why is, like, a legal comedy shot in CinemaScope? Doesn't make any sense. So you know what? You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say for this, um, I, I really like the, uh, the taller aspect ratio in the first Raimi Spider-Man, and um, I want to see more movies do that. 12pack88 says, I've heard you mention the book Story by Robert McKee before when giving advice on screenwriting. I'm curious, are there any other screenwriting books that you'd recommend to those starting out? I've been watching a ton of lessons from the screenplay videos, and I was thinking of picking up some of the books that Michael recommended. I mean, like, the Sid Field, like, screenplay book is a really obvious classic one. I know I've got some more that I'm forgetting about. Here's the thing. Um, Michael Tucker and Lessons from the Screenplay, uh, they, they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They read a lot more screenwriting books than I do. So just uh, listen to Michael. Um, if he recommends books, check them out. He, kn he knows what he's doing. Juhana asks, what is the most movie to ever movie? Uh, I mean, RRR this year, top contender. 
There's a lot going on there. Aquaman? Aquaman. Harry VVEBB uh, says, uh, in regards to the Owls of Gahul movie, if you could travel back to your elementary school scholastic book fair, oh, I miss those so much, and pick out a children's YA book series to get the Hollywood movie treatment, what would it be and who would be behind the camera? Several years back, back in the days when uh, YouTube was not my full-time job, and before I made video essays, when all my videos were like, you know, like narrative things, fake trailers and stuff like that. I had this one video that I had written, but I never actually made. And, um, and it fits into this. So I grew up reading like every Goosebumps book. As in, like I was a kid when the original Goosebumps books were being published. I started reading them in like first grade and like every month I would get the new one. I had them all, I was obsessed. And the thing about Goosebumps is, is like I'm aware that I think kids still read them, but the generation that grew up with Goosebumps uh, is like my age. People in like their 30s and 20s and stuff like that. And so I always thought it would be cool to adapt Goosebumps books into feature films, into like an anthology movie series, but honestly do them as R-rated movies uh, because they'd be aimed at the kids who grew up reading those books who were adults now. Um, I will say I did enjoy uh, the Goosebumps movie with Jack Black, but also it's like, you could have just adapted the books. Like that's, that's an option too. The reason I mention the YouTube thing is we were gonna make a fake trailer for like an R-rated Say Cheese and Die uh, movie. Uh, you know, the, the one about, like, the haunted camera that, like, takes pictures of what will happen in the future. Um, that, that would be cool. And, uh, and who would be behind the camera? I would. But also, this would be a fun thing for, I don't know, like, James Wan to produce and then, like, have each one cost, like, I don't know, $10 million and, like, you can make a bunch at the same time because, uh, they don't need the same characters or actors or anything. Goosebumps, it could be a cash cow. Warner Brothers, what are you doing? Or whoever owns the rights. Paul Now Wiki the Fourth says, with calling Snyder's style very video gamey, is there a game you think he'd be a great choice for adapting, or at least one you'd like to see done by him? I, I should mention that I haven't really played video games in like a decade, so I'm out of the loop on those. But uh, God of War seems like an obvious one. I know people on Twitter mentioned Mortal Kombat. Basically, if it's kind of brainless and has super-powered people killing each other in cool ways, he'd be well-suited for it. Honestly, Snyder probably would have been a way better fit for a Warcraft movie than Duncan Jones was, although Snyder's would need to be rated R. Um, that would make sense. Just, just let him have, like, orcs with axes murder each other. That's all you need. Okay, uh, Pinball Witch with a long question. My main question relating to the video essay is this, and I will totally understand skipping this for any kind of Q&A video, as this is intended to not have a correct answer, but I'm gonna answer it anyway, because why not? Um, even if the really iffy stuff uh, reads that can, can contribute to racism, sexism, fascism, etc., is not intentional, does that matter? If it's there, shouldn't it still be a discussion to be had? I would argue it's just as important, and in fact, maybe more so. We all bring with us our own history and unintended biases. This is, of course, a line of questioning I don't intend anyone to have an easy, simple answer to. Just one of those things that I think gets ignored when we focus on intentional messaging. Uh, short answer, yes, absolutely. In fact, I think, uh, to use your language, these iffy things, like, uh, like, like, you know, racist, sexist elements uh, uh, present in a movie, I usually think they are not intended. I don't think directors are going and being like, I don't like women. I am going to portray them poorly in these films uh, and treat them as objects to be desired and leered at. Um, I don't think they're usually doing that. Usually these elements are there um, revealing aspects of the director's subconscious, things they are they are doing instinctively without really thinking that much about. Like, for instance, as we all know, I am endlessly fascinated by Michael Bay. Uh, I like a lot of his movies. There's ones that I don't like. I think his movies are complicated and fascinating. I think he's an interesting artist. He also is a director who has problematic or, or iffy 
aspects of his movies recur frequently throughout them, whether it is the way that his movies like uh, basically portray all women as like fetishized sex objects, um, people of color often being like cartoonish comic relief stereotypes, stuff like that, uh, the way he, uh, you know, the way he portrays like military or law enforcement, things like that. And but with Bay, these recur so often that you can look at them and say like, oh, these really are a reflection of how this person feels because he puts them in everything, because they are always present. My thing with Snyder is that these iffy elements do not necessarily recur in all the movies. In fact, there's cases like I talked about in the video where you'll have the fascist themes and imagery in 300, but then you have the Owl movie, which is explicitly about fighting against fascism and fighting against white supremacy and a society that uses, you know, eugenics and is all about, like, genetic purity in the same way the heroes of 300 are. And then in Man of Steel, they reimagine Kryptonian society as, like, this fascist society that uses uh, a, like, sci-fi eugenic system to genetically engineer its population, and then they have Superman turn against that and fight against it. So that is, again, a movie about fighting against fascism. And so my thing with Snyder is just that these iffy elements, um, from my observation, do not really recur enough across his body of work uh, to really seem like they are a reflection of, like, a consistent worldview, especially because, like, an iffy element in one movie will then be contradicted in another movie. And so, yes, I think they are totally worth talking about and should be talked about, um, but that's why I didn't spend a lot of time with them. I hope that made sense. Okay, another question from Pinball Witch. Uh, would Snyder be the best person to direct an actual live-action Dragon Ball Z movie? I honestly don't think so. With Snyder's tendency to make things longer than they need to be, you know, he made a four-hour Justice League movie, and Dragon Ball Z being the most decompressed, dragged out show of all time. Like, they'll throw one punch per episode. So I think that might be a bad mix. And also, I think Snyder might be a bit too self-serious for the silliness of Dragon Ball Z. So, not my pick. I'm also not a huge Dragon Ball Z fan. Sam Corbett Davies says, As a huge Batman fan, how do you feel about his no guns slash killing rule? The conclusion to the otherwise great Reeves movie was basically, watch Batman let terrorists shoot into a crowd because he insists on punching them one at a time, which is, in my opinion, kind of a morally obscene thing to have the hero of your movie do. If your priority is finding the most logical, efficient, practical way to stop criminals, using a gun to kill them would, would probably be more effective. Um, but also, we're talking about Batman here, and um, and this is about a character who dresses up like a, a giant bat and runs around punching criminals at night. Um, and so I feel like uh, practicality and logic and efficiency are pretty much off the table here because that's, you know, generally not considered the best way to— uh, fight crime. The whole point of Batman is that when he is a child, he makes a vow that he is going to dedicate the rest of his life to stopping the kind of thing that happened to him and his parents from happening to anyone else, or at least trying to make that happen. And part of his vow is that he will not commit the crime that was done to his parents to anyone else, and he will not use the weapon that killed them Ever. This is, it's a very simple, very childlike vow, um, but I think it is, it gets to the heart of Batman. It all comes down to this one thing. I will dedicate the rest of my life to fighting crime and stopping murders from happening, and I will not do murders myself because murder is the reason that I turned out this way, is that I'm so fucked up and my life is ruined. And so, yeah, I think that vow is more important than like, you know, the real-world practicality of, you know, it'd probably be easier to just get a gun and shoot them. So that's my take on it. Paul Jensek says, Considering that 300 and Watchmen are adaptations that might seem faithful but miss the points of the original, do you think that an adaptation needs to have a new take on the original text to have merit, or can they have a similar approach without being pointless? 
Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are there are plenty of film adaptations of books that are like word for word the original and are still great. Like I was just listening to uh, the Blank Check episode on Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, and that movie is like the book, except for the last chapter. But like it's 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 extremely faithful. It's like the book put on screen, um, and it's great. Uh, and it also um, justifies being a movie enough and uses the cinematic form enough to uh, to make a case for why an adaptation has a reason to exist. So yeah, I don't think there's any one specific way you have to do a film adaptation. Um, as long as the movie is good and, um, you know, at least like justifies existing and being a movie as in like, you know, is there a reason to make this movie as opposed to just reading the book that's already there? Um, then yeah, any approach can potentially be valid. Okay, we are now done with the many questions from the Discord. Uh, it is now on to the comments section from the Zack Snyder video. Here we go. So there's a lot of comments here that are just people saying very nice things about the video. Um, thank you, Emma, for collecting these uh, to, so I can feel good by seeing, oh, the nice things people said about the video. I don't need to read these all on camera, but I appreciate that that, uh, that people seems to like it. Um, even people who were big Zack Snyder fans uh, had nice things to say, and so that was great. Um, several people here telling me that they've seen the Owl movie before, which really doesn't seem right. And I think it's honestly kind of rude to uh, be like spreading lies in the comment section. Um, don't do that. Sunshine Moon RX says, I think even beyond video games, it bears mentioning how the groundwork for this method of making superpowers look right in live action was laid down in manga and anime, like most obviously DBZ back in the 80s and 90s, when it was just easier to do that in a drawn medium. If you compare that show to like Superman movies coming out at the time, which may or may not have been a direct influence on Snyder, but can't be more than a couple degrees of separation away. Yeah, I, I think you can make a strong case for that, especially aspects just like, like moments of stillness, like right before punches and stuff like that. You, you can definitely draw lines between animated superpower battles on like Dragon Ball Z are, I mean, even like stuff in the, uh, in like the Superman animated series and the Justice League animated series, they did things very simply and very effectively. Uh, and yes, there's definitely overlap between those and how Snyder visualized powers. Okay, Sean Burry says, I know this video seems like it may have been a bit of an obligation for you rather than a passion project, but I think it's one of your best. Based takes all around. Thank you. Um, I should say that I know, you know, it did it did seem kind of like an obligation, but at the end of the day, I was the one who put it on Patreon as a Patreon goal. And I will say the only reason that I put it up there, I mean, not the only reason because people were demanding it for years, but what finally made me put it up there is that I had the idea to uh, do the Snyder video, but spend it mostly talking about the Owl movie. And so once I had that idea and I decided that would be actually fun to do, you know, I, I, I wasn't dreading it so much because I, I, I knew there was a way I could have some fun with it. Keith Quirk says, so damn good, love this, love all the vids. If you're looking for another video essay idea similar to this one, I've got a thesis for you to look into. I'd love to see you do a diagnosis of Tim Burton and his post-millennium career. Anyway, love these videos, keep up the great work. This this is one that I just don't think is going to happen. Uh, I've never been a huge Tim Burton guy, and, um, and you know, there's some bad movies in his post-millennium career. I really don't ever want to watch Alice in Wonderland again, so I'm afraid that's a video for someone else to make. Rohith Dar, uh, I'm so sorry that I'm probably butchering this name, and many of the names, I love the coining of the term himbo auteur, and I feel that it is apt for Snyder. I'm curious for Patrick to answer if there are any directors who would fit that label as well. Would say the likes of Michael Bay, Roland Emmerich, McGee, or Joe Carnahan be considered himbo auteurs, or are there other directors that better fit that label? I think part of me you applying the himbo auteur label 
uh, comes from Zack Snyder's just like off, I, I, I guess, behind the scenes personality. You know, he he's always like talking about things being awesome and it's just like seems like a, like very much like a, a regular dude, uh, which I think is, you know, part of the appeal with with his fan base that he doesn't seem like, you know, a a, a stuffy, uh, you know, director like most of the rest. He's just he's just a dude that they could hang out with. Um, yeah, like why people voted for George W. Bush. I should cut that out. That's 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 rude. Um, Snyder's not a war criminal. Of these people, Roland Emmerich seems honestly too serious when you hear him talk about stuff. Michael Bay, he's not a himbo. He's like a, a scary maniac. Um, McGee, not a no tour. I mean, come on, what is a McGee movie? Um, and Joe, Joe Carnahan is also uh, too intense and gritty. And so I don't think any of these guys quite fit the term. I don't, I'm not sure who else might. I don't know, in the comment section. Who are the other himbo auteurs? Are, are there none? Is Zach the only one? Crack, crack, cratch. A couple months ago, I finally got around to watch Night of the Coconut and loved it so much that I decided to make a little fan art which I posted to Reddit and got literally no upvotes. I quickly forgot about it and moved on with my life only for Patrick to showcase it at the end of this video. Wow, I've never felt so excited in my life. I don't even remember the drawing. Uh, so imagine my absolute surprise when it appeared on screen. Nothing but thanks for the love. Thank you, Cratch, Crack, however you pronounce it. For doing the fan art. Um, a thing that we're, if you if you didn't see, uh, a thing that uh, we're going to be doing at the end of videos, when there is new fan art, uh, you know, that people send in inspired by the videos, um, yeah, we'll feature it during the end credits uh, of the episodes over the Patreon credits because it's cool and I think it's fun and uh, I'm always so flattered and amazed whenever anyone does fan art. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and that, that would be, and once again, um, Emma tracked that piece down. Um, and so here's an incentive. Do fan art. I like it. And then we'll put it in the videos. Gardo Goes Geek says that speed ramping scene is good, but I do have to point out an episode of Power Rangers did it five years earlier in the episode Forever Red, directed by Koichi Sakamoto, a director still heavily involved in the tokusatsu, genre in Japan. It wasn't as popular or quite as slick, but it wasn't an invention of Snyder. Uh, I must admit, I have not seen that episode of Power Rangers, or for that matter, any episode of Power Rangers since 1996. Um, and so I believe you. I can't, but I, I cannot confirm this for myself. Amit R says, about the Martian Manhunter thing, Jean has been portrayed black for a while, even before Snyder's take in shows like Smallville, Young Justice, Supergirl, and Justice League the Animated Series. This is true. I am aware of this. Uh, the great Carl Lumbly does his voice uh, on the Justice League cartoon. Um, I didn't say Snyder invented it or was the first to do it, just that it is a deviation from the original source material. So that's all. Beezer production says, great analysis, very even handed, and you gave credit where credit was due. For the next video, I can't guess what the most 80s movie ever is, but I sort of think Van Halen's Jump is the most 80s song ever. It helps that it was in the trailer for Ready Player One. Jump is a very 80s song. Uh, that is undeniable. Also, does anyone else always forget, like, how the song Jump goes after, like, the opening minute of it. Like, I can't tell you what the chorus to Jump is. I can just tell you what, like, the beginning of Jump is. Like, does anyone ever listen to the full song? Probably. Van Halen was a very popular band. You know, another contender for most 80s song, um, Party All the Time by Eddie Murphy. I don't know. That's not what the video is about. But, uh, sound off in the comments. Z.R. Gan says, Emma Logsdon is the surprise cameo we didn't know we needed. Her unbridled enthusiasm and sincere passion for Guardians of Gahul is so infectious and authentic. More Emma, please. Emma, did you, did you pull this comment just so I would read that out loud and get people to shout more Emma, please? I mean, we should have more Emma, always. I, would, I, I wish we could just do a Guardians of Gahul segment in every video, but it's probably not going to be ever relevant again. But Emma will be back. Emma's great. We all love Emma. More than one person 
mentioned that Snyder should probably make a Conan the Barbarian movie, and I agree. <laughs> uh, this is the single funniest comment uh, from this whole episode. Um, I love how utterly massive and jacked Patrick's agent looks. He really oozes confidence. Uh, <laughs> I did send it to Dave, and Dave's response was, ha 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 ha. Um, yeah, we, we are very entertained. Fabian Rivnet. Uh, Rivnet, I don't know, I'm sorry. Uh, this video is awesome. The new aesthetics and updated narrative are great. This new season is up to a great start. The Nebula version is also great. Wow, thanks a lot. Not even a question. So easy for me to respond to. Rokuro Kubi. Oh my god, this is good. I worked on the Nintendo DS video game adaptation of Legend of the Guardians. The Owl movie, The Game? There is an Owl game? Oh my god. I have so many questions. Is there a way to play that online? I'm just... I, I love that there's an Owl movie game. The Gamer's Advocate says, So I've heard people suggest before that all great artists start out, consciously or subconsciously, recreating their biggest influences. Snyder is certainly a good example of this. Do you think your own filmmaking has done this too? If so, what work has been your biggest influence and how have you grown as a filmmaker toward or away from recreating it? Um, I think I'm too early in my filmmaking career to really answer that question. It's a thing where, like, I can say, like, the movies that I made in high school and college, like, between 2004 to, like, 2008 or nine. Uh, like, relentlessly ripped off Edgar Wright. Uh, but, you know, I was, like, a kid at the time. So much of my filmmaking work these days is in the videos, and that is really dictated by limitations, uh, whether it's, you know, oh, it has to fit into the topic of the video, or then, oh, it's the scene where I have to act in it, and so we have to shoot it all with static shots because I have to set up the camera on a tripod and then get in front of it. Um, and so basically what I'm saying is these are not like the the purest expressions of my, my filmmaking voice, I guess. Wow, that sounded insufferable. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I think maybe once I make more more narrative projects uh, that are like, that are not tied to the YouTube videos and just more like original projects. Maybe then um, I, I guess I can start recreating my biggest influences and we can all find out together what those are. Matthew Bowie, or Bowie, says, hey, so I love this. I'm curious, how does this kind of literalism in the director map onto the way George Lucas approached influences? I ask because, much like Snyder, there are a bunch of beats in Star Wars that don't make logical or narrative sense, but that can be traced to prior movies in a super literal way. Is there a tradition of film citation as gratuitous literalism? I honestly am not sure I understand that question. Um, what beats in Star Wars don't make narrative sense? Um, I'm trying to think of, like, a beat in Empire Strikes Back that doesn't make sense, but is just, like, a quote from, I don't know, like, a Kurosawa film. I'm honestly not sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, if you're watching this, please reply in the comments, and, and uh, if, if you could expand on this a bit more, because I'm just, I'm not sure I, I really know how to answer it. A uh, friend of Gabbro says, Dear Pat, I feel like it's sadly unlikely that you'd make a director's commentary on your old video, What If Zack Snyder Adapted Classic Works of Literature, but I'd love to hear your favorite moments of filming it and any thoughts you have now looking back. Cheers. Okay, for those who are not aware, back in the old days, 2016, back uh, when I, uh, when this YouTube channel was not my full-time job, when it made no money, back before I made video essays, and all the videos were like narrative shorts in some way, I made a video, uh, I think in like August or September 2016, called What If Zack Snyder Adapted Classic Works of Literature? Because the news about him wanting to make The Fountainhead had come out, and I thought it was really funny, and I thought it would be funny to apply his style and approach to other 
works of literature. And so we had three segments in the video. Um, I'm trying to remember, is the video on YouTube or is it like blocked because of like music or something? Anyway, there were three segments in the video. Uh, there was Zack Snyder's Catcher in the Rye, Zack Snyder's Sense and Sensibility, and Zack Snyder's The Giving Tree. Thinking back, I'm least fond of the Catcher in the Rye one, mostly because that one was tough on a technical level because I was like renting a camera to shoot it on and didn't spend enough time testing it out and was trying to like figure out the camera and how to shoot slow-mo with it. And I could have done a better job with that. Um, it was also all voiceover because, you know, all the narration in Catcher in the Rye. And so I think, you know, that was a little bit limiting. Um, we drove out to Long Island to get a field to shoot the Sense and Sensibility one in. And I will say, I'm, uh, I'm still very proud of putting a CrossFit montage with uh, the, is it the Dashwood sisters? And there, yeah, the, the CrossFit montage in Sense and Sensibility, I'm really proud of that. And I think the best segment was the Giving Tree one, where uh, my friend Paul Stedham actually built us like a rain machine so we could have it all in the rain. And uh, my buddy Mac Costello was there like shirtless with an ax in the rain, uh, yelling at a tree. And um, I think that was pretty great. I'm like, I'm genuinely very proud of Zack Snyder's Giving Tree. So, so yeah, that was, that was always a favorite of mine. Isaac Pooler. Hear me out. I don't know Snyder's motivations for The Watchmen, but turning the movie into the exact opposite of what the graphic novel was trying to portray seems intentional, like maybe he was missing the point on purpose. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think it's kind of like when people say, oh, 300 is meant to be a satire. I'm like, I just don't think there's enough evidence there. Like, the thing about Snyder's Watchmen is that um, it's not all the opposite of what the comic is. Because again, it's adapted almost word for word from the comic and um, and like panel for panel from the comic. So it, it it is explicitly trying to do the exact same thing as the comic. And there's parts where that actually works. If he were trying to do the opposite, then he would have made more changes and not been so absurdly faithful. So I just, I think you're giving him too much credit. I don't think... I don't think this is the case. Jack Bryan says, please make a video on Christopher Nolan too. Uh, Jack, um, I did two years ago. Uh, there's a video about Christopher Nolan uh, called, I believe it's called How IMAX Made Christopher Nolan a Better Filmmaker. Um, you should go watch it. I, I made a Nolan video. Ice Cream Hero says, isn't it mean to call someone a himbo? It could be. I'm not sure, I don't think it's mean. I think it's um, a backhanded compliment. It, is it a complicult? Um, I don't know. I don't think I was very mean to Zack Snyder in this video, and I'm, I don't call him a himbo intending to be mean. Uh, D. Kamara Man. Oh, this is, this is a fun one. The destruction in Man of Steel and BVS isn't glorified. Also, it's Clark's first time being Superman. Also, name one superhero movie that doesn't have collateral damage. Uh, if you feel bad about the destruction, good. All caps. That's the point. So, D. Kamara Man, I'm pretty sure you're not a subscriber to this channel, and I doubt you are watching this video right now. So, in a way, what's the point of replying? But I, I will, I will reply anyway, and I'll try to make this as quick as I can. Um, first of all, I did not say the destruction in these movies was glorified, okay? Uh, you are putting words in my mouth. Um, also, it's Clark's first time being Superman. My question for you is, uh, does that mean um, he's bad at being Superman? Does it mean that he uh, doesn't know how to use his powers? Does it mean that um, I... When he when he punches uh, that guy into the train yard uh, that all that all blows up, um, is he trying to like punch him into a field? But uh, since he's new at being Superman, he he slips and punches him in the wrong direction, um, and so he's just messing up. Um, I don't think that's the case. Even though he's new at being Superman, 
When we see him in that sequence, he has by now totally mastered his powers. We see that the other Kryptonians are not used to using their powers and they are uncomfortable with it and it, it's, it's weird to them and they're adjusting. Clark knows what he's doing. Also, uh, and if you feel bad about the destruction, good, that's the point. So I'm, I, I'm so sorry to, to bring back up that the stupid, annoying debate that we were all sick of in 2013 about, about the portrayal of destruction and collateral damage and civilian deaths in Man of Steel, but I will, I will make this as quick as I can. Here's why I think it matters. Because if the point of the movie was to portray this all from a regular human's perspective, uh, looking at Superman and General Zod and the other Kryptonians as, uh, you know, horrible, destructive gods who don't give a shit about humanity and are just wreaking havoc uh, and killing people wherever they go. Um, the thing is, that's what the opening scene of Batman v Superman is, showing it all from Bruce Wayne's perspective, and that is effective. That is not what Man of Steel is doing. Man of Steel is told almost exclusively from Clark Kent's perspective, putting us in his shoes, we are meant to empathize with him. And the first two thirds of this movie are all about Clark Kent debating whether or not to reveal himself and his abilities and who he is and what he can do to humanity because he is afraid because Kevin Costner, you know, got him all scared about this. He's afraid that humanity will reject him and, uh, and you know, will not accept him as one of their own and be scared of him. So two-thirds of the way into the movie, he makes the choice he's going to reveal himself to humanity. He is going to side with humanity and protect humanity because he cares about the humanity. The first two-thirds of the movie are about his relationship with humanity. Um, and that is the point. They also do things like uh, they have the other Kryptonians point out that his weakness is his sense of morality, the sense that he cares about other people and wants to protect them. They underline this. They make it very clear that Clark Kent cares about humanity. And the thing about Zack Snyder's role as the director is he chooses all the shots. He makes choices like, okay, uh, when, when Superman is like, like, you know, grabbing General Zod, let's make the choice to have him fly through the silo and let's have it explode this big. Uh, when he crashes him into an IHOP, let's fill that IHOP with bystanders who are coming very, very close to being killed. Um, when he, throws, when he throws that one guy into the train yard, um, let's have that explosion so big that it basically consumes the whole train yard. When Zod throws a fuel truck at Superman on a crowded street in Metropolis, let's have Superman hop over the fuel truck, have it explode behind him, blowing up the building behind him, and have Superman not even turn and look to see if, oh, is anyone in that building? Whatever. He doesn't do any of these things. What I'm asking you to do, D. Kamara Man, is to simply look at the shots in this movie uh, and try to interpret meaning from them. What are these shots telling us? Because I think my reading of these shots is that they are telling me that Superman is not especially concerned with whether or not humans uh, are hurt or killed. Uh, while he is fighting these other people. Again, if you want the script telling us that Clark Kent cares about humanity, we see him catch that one soldier who falls from the helicopter. He seems concerned about him. Um, but then he's just smashing people through gas stations um, and blowing things up left and right and um, doesn't seem especially concerned. And, and this is what I think the problem is. I think the problem is that there's just this disconnect between what the visuals are saying and what the script seems to be saying. Uh, and Snyder is making the choice to feature visuals that basically portray Superman as this uncaring, destructive god uh, who doesn't really give a shit if people die. Um, and so that's my take. Weezing336 says, who is this we that loves The Incredibles and Ratatouille? Uh, literally anyone with taste. What's wrong with you? 
Thomas Tyrell says, I'd like to see this released in a snarkier version, you know, a Snyder cut. Oh, and, um, and okay, and that's the end. Wow, we ended on that one? Oh, well, anyway, this was long. The Snyder video was long. Um, I'm losing my voice uh, from talking so much. Anyway, um, sign up for the Patreon uh, if you want to ask questions for the next video. Now I am going to uh, go resume watching the 80s skateboarding film Thrashin, starring a young Josh Brolin. Uh, in the scene that I just watched, um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers show up years before, like, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, when they were not very famous yet. Um, so far, it's, uh, it's pretty 80s. So, anyway, thank you for all the questions. This has been a lot of fun. Cheers. I'll see you next time.